I'm Maddie Dykwald, and I'm an author of a book called Influence, How Women's Soaring Economic Power Will Transform Our World for the Better. I'm also co-founder of a company called AgeWave, which is a think tank uh, focused on the future trends that pertain to demographics. Well, if you think about it for a minute, you'd really begin to realize that for thousands of years, uh, women were really economically dependent on men. Uh, and that's just the way it was. I mean, in fact, if my grandmother or great-grandmother were alive today, she just wouldn't even believe the way the world works and the way women have really gained economic power. I think if you go back to the 1960s, you begin to see the early signs of that because baby boomer women were the first generation in mass to get that education. And education was really the key for women succeeding in the workplace, not just entering the workplace, but staying in the workplace and getting really some pretty good earning power. Uh, back then, very few women prior to the baby boom generation had that opportunity, but this generation went in there and made it happen. And education really has been sort of at the heart of what's allowed women to really gain that economic power that has transformed their role in society from now and well into the future. What's so interesting to me is that while women were gaining their education for the very first time in history, we saw our economy transform itself pretty dramatically. We went from an economy that was in industrial, manufacturing-based, where uh, brawn really defined your role and gave you the power to really earn income, to a more knowledge-based economy where the skill set was more education-based. So women got that education at exactly the right moment in history that allowed them to really succeed in the workplace. Today, for the very first time, we see a critical mass of women uh, entering the workforce with that education and gaining earning power. In fact, what's so incredible is that if you were to look over the last 30 years, what you would notice is that men's income has remained rather flat if you adjust for inflation, whereas women's income has grown exponentially. Now, of course, some of that is just trying to catch up, and we're still not all the way there. There is still a lot of work to be done, but women have gained incredible incredible power economically and they're beginning to take that power and translate it into all kinds of interesting ways of doing things different than the way men have. What we begin to understand as we see large numbers of women with earning power is that women in fact do use their money differently than men. Uh, in fact, it's been noted even in developing countries that 90% of women take their income and they reinvest it in their families and their communities while in those same developing nations only about 30 to 70% of men take that money and reinvest it in families and communities. They have a tendency to spend it on alcohol and tobacco. So, you know, it doesn't sound really great on the surface, but that's just really the truth in developing countries. But even in the United States, what we notice is that women have a tendency to spend their money more on their family, uh, more on education, on health, and on things that really make life for families a little bit better. That's good news. One of the great pieces of news that we've seen actually manifest itself as we see more women in the workforce, more women taking on positions of leadership, is that there's an actual economic benefit to companies, to countries, uh, to the economy at large. For instance, uh, based on studies that have been done, what we've noticed is that when Fortune 500 companies have more women in positions of leadership, their profitability actually increases. And when we're talking about board of directors, for Fortune 500 companies in particular, having at least three women on their board of directors sees increased profitability. That's good news. Uh, what else do we see? We see in countries, developing countries, when they educate their young women and girls, they see an increase in GDP. So there's a bottom line return. We see more countries doing that as a result. Again, great news. And according to The Economist, the number one thing that we have seen actually 
improve our economy over the last decade has been women in the workforce and not the economy of China or India and not the growth of technology. It's women in the workforce. This is great news. It comes as no surprise to anyone that women buy things. They always have. In fact, throughout most of history, even though women weren't economically very independent, they were generally sort of the chief family and household purchaser of household things, uh, clothing, food, uh, the small items. And the big items like automobiles and financial service products, insurance, real estate, those were considered the sort of decision domain of men. And that's just not the case anymore. In fact, 83% of all consumer purchases today are made by women. And women, in fact, do have a large say if not the final say, in most large decisions today in terms of the marketplace. And marketers tend to forget that. They still tend to think, oh, automobiles, let me talk to the guy. Uh, real estate, let me talk to the guy. Yet, using real estate as, as an example, uh, when we're talking about who buys residential homes, right behind married couples is single women, the second largest segment of purchasers of real estate today. Now, that's influence. Yet the real estate marketplace, even though there are so many realtors who are women, doesn't generally do their marketing and their advertising campaigns to women per se. Uh, the automobile industry, for instance, where women buy 62% of all new car purchases, they are notorious for doing a horrible job of speaking out to women. Uh, if anything, they give just kind of lip service or what we call pink marketing to women, and that's going to have to change. In fact, we're seeing the early signs of that changing right now. Uh, electronics, another great example. We used to think of electronics as, you know, toys for boys. Not anymore. 55% of all electronic purchases are made for women. So women have a seat at the table. Marketers, if they want to hold on to women as these key customers, are going to have to try to dig deep, figure out what women really want, because most women say they feel very misunderstood by the marketplace. I think this is good news for men and good news for women for a couple reasons. Uh, first, improved profitability in companies, increased GDP in countries, and, and, and an improved overall economy. Well, that's good news for everybody. Uh, second, the idea that gender should be the number one thing that defines our roles in society seems a little ludicrous and sort of old school. And many men have told me, and I've interviewed a lot of men over the last several years about this very issue, they've told me they love the idea that no longer are they defined completely in their role in society by being a guy. I mean, there's lots of men that feel that their skill set or their talent is much more relevant to maybe being a stay-at-home dad or maybe having sort of a part-time or a consulting type of arrangement. And they look forward to the opportunity of really moving towards a more partnership society. Uh, you know, one of the interesting things that happened to me in my life is that I got a chance to have dinner once with Betty Friedan. And I was with my husband, and I asked her. I got up my nerve when she, of course, it was when she was alive. Uh, and I got up my nerve, and I asked her, I said, what made you decide to write The Feminine Mystique? And I think her answer is one that's really relevant to this question that you just asked. She said, you know, I just didn't want women to be judged by the metric of men moving forward. I would say it's the same thing for men. They need to be judged as individuals and based on the talent and skills that they have individually rather than being just a guy. It's interesting because we've seen dramatic shifts take place in society in terms of the role of women. And we don't often think about it. I mean, just think back a uh, hundred years ago, women couldn't vote. Uh, women didn't have the right to own property. In fact, they were considered property of their husbands. And women couldn't even open a bank account in their own name. So we've seen dramatic shifts. 
one of the key shifts took place during the baby boomer generation as they were growing up, and that was back in the 1960s. That's when the doors of higher education really opened up for women. And in fact, baby boomer women were the pioneers of many of the great strides we've seen women take in the workforce today, and that's great news. Uh, in fact, when you talk to younger women, they don't even understand, really, th how bad it was or how difficult it was for women in the past. So now you see young women graduating from high school uh, in better shape to go into college than men, graduating from college in higher numbers than men. I mean, for every 100 men who graduate from college, there's uh, 131 women. I mean, that's a huge difference. And now you see women, young women, in urban centers like New York, uh, Paris, Frankfurt, uh, San Francisco, where I'm from. You see them entering the workforce in similar positions to men having as much income or even more income. So that's a huge breakthrough, and hopefully we'll see that translate into continued growth in their positions and the opportunity to move into leadership positions because that's the next step. That's the tipping point at which we're at right now. Women not just entering the workforce and staying, but taking on lots of the key leadership positions. And that hasn't happened yet, but my hope is that we're going to begin to see that happening more and more. Today we see the middle class really struggling to hold on and, you know, it's not good news for anybody, but I think it's important to keep in mind that the only reason we have anyone in the middle class today is really because of women in the workforce. Uh, now, what do I mean by that? Well, over the last 30 years, the only families that have seen any increase in, in income at all is when the wife is working. That's pretty incredible. What it really translates into is the fact that dual income families are the only ones who have thrived over the last 30 years. So instead of just having one income to be middle class today, we need two. And that is a huge transformation that puts a strain on all kinds of families. Uh, we, that is the direction we're going to be moving. We need to be aware of it and we need to really recognize the contribution that women have made to families. The baby boom generation is a large population that has always got a tremendous amount of attention from the media, I'm sometimes very positive, mostly pretty negative. Uh, and I'm a baby boomer myself, so I can appreciate both sides of the coin there. But we need to keep in mind that this generation is very different than generations that came before them and have been kind of the pioneers of many of the attitudes and values of younger generations alive today. Uh, so think about it. They're very irreverent. Uh, kind of cynical, uh, very well educated, and have often been portrayed in the media and by other generations as being very narcissistic, self-centered, uh, out for themselves really. And, you know, frankly, I think it's a bit of a bum rap. I mean, the baby boom generation has done much for our world, for the economy in general. They've been the pioneers of the whole entrepreneurial uh, trends that we see taking place today. Uh, one of the biggest legacies of the baby boomers, I believe, is women. I mean, I think the boomer women have really been the pioneers of women not just entering the workforce, but thriving in the workforce and taking on new roles and responsibilities in families. Uh, I also think that the baby boom generation has been very innovative. I mean, they love something new, something different. You know, keep in mind, they're the ones that were around who really began the whole technology technology revolution and you know they're at the forefront of all these fantastic trends but they get very little credit for it and instead they get blamed and they will be blamed by the way for the debacle we are about to experience when we see 78 million Americans begin to enter retirement not being able to afford retirement it's going to be a horrible thing and also being recipients of Medicare and taking that system and putting it on its head. I mean, we're just not prepared for such a large population of older adults, and they're going to get blamed for all the financial woes that will come as a result of this, but it's really unfair because our government has done a very poor job of getting the right 
uh, services in place to really be ready to service